Celebrating 12 years of possibility. Pilot Flying J and Halloran Hilton Hill present Anything is Possible. Today's guest, Tammy Franklin. Welcome to Anything is Possible. I'm Halloran Hilton Hill. These are great stories about great people whose lives prove that anything is possible. And my guest today is Tammy Franklin. Um, Tammy, give me the full correct title. Senior Vice President of... Well, and what's funny is since we initially spoke, it's changed already. So okay. It's, <laughs> so actually, it's a simple title, Executive Vice President of Digital. Wow. <laughs> so what do you do? Yeah, oh boy, that's a fully, uh, that's a big question. Um, really, my job is really focused around helping Scripps think about how we fully integrate and scale all of our digital efforts. So these are all the digital extensions. It's our websites, it's, uh, it's our applications, it's other touch points to consumers that don't have to do with the traditional television set with a focus on video, which is obviously what we do really well. You know, when you look at the numbers um, and, and viewing patterns, I'm noticing in every pro promo from every network, mm -hmm. they're holding up a phone or they're holding up an iPad. Yeah. Yeah. that this third screen is becoming yes. the primary screen. Yes. You look at the, just the sheer number of videos that are being uploaded mm -hmm. to YouTube every day. Yes. Um, that's where it is. Yes. The, the funny thing though about digital is it moves so fast. It's such a moving target that just about the time <laughs> you think you've got it nailed down, it just keeps moving. That's absolutely correct. I would imagine that that's a, a profound executive challenge. It is, it is. But it's also the exciting part of it because the good news is you always have a chance to do it a little bit better and the course correct. Um, you know, if you think about people, the, the uh, first mover's advantage is not as appropriate any longer because what you knew yesterday might not be applicable on a right. moving forward basis. So you get a chance every day to, to get ahead of the curve or to do something better than the next guy because it is, it's a constantly moving target. But it's a challenge to think about where it's going. Um, and a lot of it's being consumer driven and obviously understanding kind of how the consumer wants to engage with your content and trying to predict that can be very difficult. Um, but I, I think that's also the exciting, that's what brings a lot of people to the space, I think. I think another interesting thing about digital though is as you push digital, mm -hmm. digital gives you so much analytical information back. Yes, so much more than ever push, before. When you push digital, uh, if somebody watches you on a conventional television yes. set, you don't know who they are, where they are, what they are. So true. But when you're pushing to digital, Absolutely. you get all this rich data, big data yes, back. Yes, you do. That allows you to understand your consumer's patterns much yes, better. Yes, you do theoretically. And what's interesting, obviously, is we have this opportunity for so much data, but because it's new, having all this data, we actually um, are not as well versed in the tool set mm -hmm. to help us understand the data. Because How it's only so it? good as so what, right? What does it right. all mean? And what does it mean for action? Something that I can act upon to make the consumer experience better. And so while we have the data, now we're getting better at actually how you package the data in a way that allows you to come to some decision point to do something on behalf of the consumer. So that's really the focus now. Yeah. So where did you grow up? I grew up in New Jersey, a little town called Port Murray, New Jersey. What is that? Oh my <laughs> goodness, it's a little farming town out in northwest Jersey near the Poconos, Delaware Water Gap area. All right, so growing up there, did you imagine this? <laughs> no. No, I'd have never imagined this. I mean, I guess a piece of you dreams, right? And so in my dream, I guess I would have always imagined traveling. I, w I always envisioned being, I actually want to be an author when I grow up one day. And so I did imagine being a successful author at some point in time. Um, I'm not quite there yet, but I'm still on that journey. And all these pieces of the path, no, I would not have imagined exactly this. You know, the other day I was, I'm privileged now to every now and then I get to ride on the corporate jet with some of the senior executives. And as we were flying over, uh, part of the country, I thought to myself, as this small child in Port Murray, New Jersey, I would have never imagined I'd be in a jet flying across the United States. It was just, it was a very interesting moment for me, I must admit. Tell me about your uh, parents. Yes, yeah, so uh, both my parents born and raised in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, they were childhood sweethearts, married fairly young, young being, you know, early 20s, back in the day was young. Um, and during the Newark riots, my father had decided to move us out of the city and to a place where he had been as a child because his sister suffered from some type of allergies. Uh, and so they were used to, you know, inner city living, right? My mother couldn't drive. She's a stay-at-home mom. She didn't drive because she had buses for transportation. And so we moved out to the boondocks. Uh, they had five children. Um, neither of them were college educated, but all five of their children were um, with a couple of graduate degrees, including 
including myself. Uh, so I would say they've done a pretty phenomenal job. Yeah, you, you have two children, and we'll talk about that in yes. a moment. But when you look back at your parents, yeah. what they overcame, yes. what they had to do, doesn't it make you sit back in awe and Absolute go, Absolute awe. How do you? You talk about Absolute the best awe. salesmen in the world, the, the people that didn't have education that Best CFOs you. in the world. I still yeah. don't know how my mother managed the books. <laughs> how do you do that? <laughs> I have no idea. I have, and the pressure it puts on me as I'm raising my children, honestly, because I obviously feel like I can't do worse than they've done. My job is to do better. But how do you do better than that? I mean, it's just it's phenomenal. Tammy Franklin is my guest. You're watching Anything is Possible in a minute. I'm just about to prove it to you. We'll be right back. Possibility powered by Pilot Flying J, Covenant Health, Home Federal, and the Knoxville News Sentinel. Coming up. And I was at the airport and I'm surrounded by people, you know, busy hustle bustle. I was in San Francisco and I had this moment all of a sudden of feeling this incredible sense of loneliness in this massive room full of people. This is Anything is Possible. My guest is Tammy Franklin with Scripps <laughs> Networks Interactive and now you're executive vice president digital. Correct. So that's that's a big swath. But thank you for being here today. My pleasure. So we were talking about growing up in New Jersey yes. and ending up here and your parents didn't have uh, college education. Correct. But they obviously had a lot of common sense education. Yes, they did. Great salespeople because they got five out of five. That's right. In and through college. Yes. And uh, that, that really is an amazing thing. Um, so you went to Yale and Harvard. Correct. How'd that happen? <laughs> I mean, I didn't, uh, I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean like, how'd that happen? <laughs> I mean it more like. I love it, I love it. <laughs> Oh, you know, great, great uh, tutelage by a lot of people. Really just had a lot of folks who, from my brother initially, um, always told me I had to work harder, even though I did very well in high school. But he reminded me I was in a very small high school. The world's a very big place. And um, there are a lot of great students out there. And that even though I was doing well, I needed to do better and push myself as, mu as much as I could. So he always pushed me to be my personal best. My parents you know, always made me believe everything was possible. So mm -hmm. uh, I can remember, in fact, very distinctly in high school, uh, word had gotten out. There aren't that many people in my high school who, who would attend those types of schools. And so word had gotten out where I had applied. I had another um, uh, gentleman who went to Princeton as well. So the two of us people talked a lot. And one, I had a, a guidance counselor who actually told me, you should be more realistic maybe you want to think about something else. And that motivated me. That really motivated me. Um, the fact that someone thought that that was not possible when I always grew up thinking that everything was possible. So things like that are very motivating factors. Um, and then you, after the Yale experience, you get very hungry for that, that, um, that challenge. So I understand you, you worked with Comcast, you've worked with Scripps, kind of mm -hmm. dot me through your uh your corporate career. Sure, sure. Well, Comcast was a client of mine up until recently on the Scripps side. I never worked directly oh, for okay. Comcast, but worked with them. You're right. That was a, they were my account at, at Scripps Networks. Um, uh, so my story is I thought I wanted to be a journalist. I love to read and write. I still do, as I mentioned. Um, but when I interviewed with Knight Ritter newspapers back in the day, they uh, had a management training program. And it was really for MBAs. I was an undergraduate at the time, but they gave me the opportunity to participate. And I thought it would be a great way to learn the business. So I said yes. And I never really went back to the reporting side of the house. Um, um, but obviously you use those communication skills every day. Mm -hmm. I'm always uh, amazed and sometimes appalled at how uh, the art of r communicating well, succinctly, mm. and exactly what you mean to say right. um, is a, becoming a lost art. It worries me about our kids today as my children text. and, and So anyway, love the fact that I had a communications background. You know what's interesting about that is writing clarifies thought. Mm -hmm. And that's why writing is so important because it forces you to organize your thinking Absolutely. and to specify what it is you want to Absolutely. communicate and then to be intentional about the best path to that. Words are very important. You've done well. Mm -hmm. I've tried. Um, you've been blessed. Are your parents still yes, alive? Yes, sir. Uh, my mother is my father's deceased, unfortunately. Right. Yes. How long ago did your father pass away? About 15 years ago. Wow. Yeah, yeah. He was very young, to 61, unfortunately. Is your mom proud of you? I think she is. I think she is. She reminds me there's some things I need to work on. <laughs> <laughs> what about your brothers? Mm, oh, very much so, and I'm proud of them as well. Yeah, yeah. So here's what surprises me about you. Mm -hmm. um, you have this incredibly bubbly personality. Um, you have a razor sharp mind. Your what I call a get it quotient is really high. <laughs> 
as we've been talking today, mm -hmm. whatever I've presented to you, you've got it in, <laughs> in, in a microsecond. And you're fresh off the loss of your husband. Yes, correct, yes. And I'm trying to reconcile yeah. how you can be so happy or mm -hmm. seem so happy yeah. and full of joy. You're raising two children without their father now. Correct. Miles and Camille. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's going on? Yeah, how do, how I know. Do, how do you? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, every day is a gift. Life is a gift. And we really try to focus on, I was married to my husband for 16 years. What happened? Yes. So um, in May of last year, he was starting to feel a little bit tired. Uh, and we thought that maybe it was just something metabolic going on. Um, and so we had pursued a few different medical avenues. And as it turned out, what we didn't know was there was unfortunately a brain tumor um, that was forming and growing. It was extremely aggressive. Um, it's a glioblastoma multiform. They call it GBM. Uh, it's the Ted Kennedy tumor. You'll hear it a lot. But it's highly aggressive um, and, and highly cancerous, unfortunately. And it had grown very large. It was sitting almost dead center of his brain. And so it had a lot of room to grow, unfortunately. By the time we discovered it, it was about the size of a fist. Um, and when he went in for surgery, surgery was very successful. We did it at Vanderbilt University. Can't say enough about the doctors and, and the entire experience there. They were fantastic. But he never really gained um, consciousness post that. And so he was in, um, in hospice for a while and unfortunately we lost him in August. So really it was from May to August. I mean it was very normal going into May and by August he was gone. Hmm. Yeah, tremendous loss, tremendous loss. Um, but we really try to focus on the 16 years we had. It was positive, two beautiful children. We led a wonderful life, we were very fortunate, had great years, um, and I try to focus on that. That's what gets me through, hmm. yeah. That's a really good answer. <laughs> it's the truth, it's the <laughs> best one I have. Um, but you know, I mean, you have your moments though. You definitely have your moments. I what got you through? What brought you to this? This, this seems very resolved. Yes. Yes. Um, but I don't think you get to this level of resolution right. without process. Yeah, oh, there's definitely. And the, I think the process is ongoing. The process is ongoing. I have moments, I was traveling the other day, and I was at the airport, and I'm surrounded by people, you know, busy hustle bustle. I was in San Francisco, and I had this moment all of a sudden of feeling this incredible sense of loneliness in this massive room full of people and I think it, that was manifesting itself a little bit you know you the, your partner the one that supports you the one that allows you to take risks and chances because you know that they're the, kind of your bedrock is no longer there and I think that's a sobering moment when you have them and they come and they go um, at times it's very acute let's talk about the way that he loved you mm -hmm. um, and maybe the way that he yet loved you yes um, because that love lingers yes. you still feel the presence of that but yes. you're a high power I, I was reading in your bio, there's some award you got for being a Wonder Woman <laughs> of the cable industry. They actually uh, use the phrase yes, Wonder they Woman, do. <laughs> right? Yes, you can imagine the jokes. <laughs> yes, yes, they so, do. So, mm -hmm. so you're one of the top mm -hmm. female executives in the cable industry, period. Yes, and I've got many colleagues, but right. yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, you're high power, you're a very high powered woman. And for a lot of men, that's really challenging. You yeah. know, mama's on the corporate jet, yeah. right? <laughs> yes. I'll see yeah. you later today. <laughs> <laughs> he was always very comfortable in his own skin. And I think really? we, yes, yes, since the time we met, quite frankly. And, and his life was a little different. He, he worked very early on um, while I was still pursuing academics. So he had worked a number of years in the newspaper industry. That's where we met. Um, and he's just always very comfortable in his skin, was always a big supporter. There was never a competition. Um, we found a really nice, uh, uh, method for raising the, the children in terms of roles and responsibilities. And they were a little bit reversed from what you would call the traditional family, but he was very comfortable with that. And I, I never, I never ever sensed that there was a resentment um, of success. We, were, we never competed. We, we always understood that we both needed to be engaged and involved and do our jobs. And his role was a stay-at-home father for a good portion of our, of our relationship. And he did one heck of a job. Isn't it freeing when you know somebody gets you? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? Yes. They understand who you are, what makes you tick, and they're there to just support that and really and relish in it. Uh, and he was. He was a huge supporter. As I won awards, or he, he couldn't have been happier for me. Wow, that's big. Tammy Franklin is my guest. You're watching Anything is Possible. And I guess this is the point at which I say, see, I told you so, but there's <laughs> more. We'll get to that in just a moment. Coming up. The... the um, gravity of trying to raise productive um, but sensitive empathetic people in today's society I think um, 
resonates with me and it resonated with my husband as well. This week, our Home Federal Bank Community Spotlight is on the Salvation Army. Did you know that the Salvation Army has been transforming lives one at a time in Knoxville since 1899 and in the past year alone has served more than 30,000 people? To learn more, visit SalvationArmy.org. My guest today on Anything is Possible is Tammy Franklin. What a, what a great story. And I have to say, you are just blessing me with your perspective. Um, you're making me imagine new possibilities uh, in my own life. And just listening to you talk about how you're processing the loss of your husband, mm -hmm. and I know it probably is very difficult for your children as well, Yes, yes. Uh, is a very powerful thing. Do you, you do understand though that the way you're processing this helps other people, that they're watching you. I would like to think, I would like to think that's the case. And I've watched others too. You know, some right. of it is modeled on my mother when she lost my father and how she handled that. I, um, uh, I had just started at Harvard Graduate School and he had a massive heart attack and my brother had to come up to Boston and tell me. Um, and I remember saying to my mother, so should I, maybe I should defer for a semester and stay home and she said, well, what do you think your father would have wanted you to do? He wouldn't, why, why, what good is that? He would have wanted and expected you. And so that, I use that now because I think about um, for myself what my husband would have wanted me and expected me to do. We were very clear about our plan in terms of our children and what, how we wanted to raise them and what we wanted for them. And I feel like it's my role to execute that plan. I feel like I would not be doing him justice if I didn't do that. So that also just keeps me going. I know exactly what I'm supposed to do. A, a phrase just jumped into my head for the mm -hmm. first time, leveraging loss, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, you, that you could yes. actually leverage it, yes. that you could actually say, okay, this gives me a cause. Yes, it does, it does. What is it, it you want for your children? Yeah, you know, I, I, the, the um, gravity of trying to raise productive, um, but sensitive, empathetic people in today's society, I think, um, resonates with me, and it resonated with my husband as well. I um, come from very humble means. My children have much more than I had as a child. I think that's a good and a bad thing, right? I worry about their resilience. I think resilience is probably one of the critical success factors in life, personally and professionally. And I worry that maybe because they didn't have to struggle as much early on. So what we wanted for them was we wanted, I think I will call what Warren Buffett says about his children, that you want to leave them with enough that they can do anything, but not so much that they don't have to do anything, right? right that they can right. do everything, but not right. so much that they can do nothing. Right. Um, and I think that's what, that's what I think about for my children. I want them to be secure so that that security allows them to take risks and reach as far as they can over that precipice, but I don't want them to be so secure that they feel like they can be lazy and not a contributor. Um, have you ever seen um, tall grass in the wind? Yes. The way it kind of... It's beautiful, yeah. You do recognize that you have that kind of an energy. <laughs> I never thought of it that way. Like when That's you walk in a room, say, yes. no, I'm serious about this. I've interviewed a lot of people yeah. and there is a, it's, there's, it's like, <laughs> there is a, a possibility vector. I just made that up. <laughs> it sounds <laughs> I, like I don't it, even though. know what it means. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. I like <laughs> it, it though. We'll good. go with it. No, but you have this, this energy coming off of you. I can see why you have been selected through your life for leadership. And, and I think part of it is not just you're smart. Um, I think it's that your smart is directed. It has a, an energy and a focus, oh. right? There's something. Interesting, there's, yeah. There's something really special about you. There's, oh, a, there's an energy. No, I mean this, that there's an energy and it is a sense of possibility. Yeah. Uh, I can feel what your parents tried to embed in you, this notion of anything right. is possible. Right, oh, I agree, I agree. So, so credit to them, credit to them. So what are the elements of that? Mm -hmm. I mean, when we talked prior to the interview, I was gonna ask you what brings you joy, what brings you courage, what brings you strength, right. and how do you make things better? But right. I'd rather know, Yeah. would you give me the code? <laughs> you should be interviewing my the mother. Source She's code. got the code, I go to her for guidance. Um, yeah, you know, I think just the um, resilience, self-awareness, um, that life is not gonna be easy, right? I mean, there, there are just some things um, that you have to be honest about, right? And it's that the road's not gonna be easy, um, 
but you, you need to you need to harness that. You need to harness the, both the, sh the things that have been great and positive in your life, as well as the things that have been negative. And how do you turn that around for something for something more positive? I love people. I think really the the, the core of what you see in me is that I really do enjoy people. So I'm enjoying this conversation. Right. And uh, when we chat, uh, just hearing your life story, I think people the the stories of where people have been. When I interview people for jobs, I don't ask them really about their resume and the right. role. I really ask them, I say, tell me your story, literally. Tell me your story. I don't want to know specifically the role, your journey. How did you right. go from one, what led you there, what did you learn, what you did. People are so inspiring and I, I am always surprised at the people on paper and then what you find out when you talk to people. There's so much more to people um, than you would normally just think or it's the, the don't judge a book by its cover, it's an old adage, but it's really when you really dig deep into people and their stories, I find that so inspiring. I get energized by people, I guess. It's, well, there's probably nothing as energizing, though, as when a person gives you their undivided attention and wants to hear your story. Yeah. yeah. And so thank you for being that kind of a person. Yeah. Ten seconds. Yes. When are you going to write the book? Yeah. Oh, um, I would say when I have time, but that's that's really just a bad yeah. excuse. Isn't <laughs> it? I just need to make time to do it. Uh, I just need to commit myself to getting that done. So I, I need to set a timeline. So whether we, we're in 2014 now, by the end of next year, I will have a book published. Okay. okay. Will you come back here? I will come back here. Thank you for being on Anything <laughs> is Possible. Thank you, Howard. <laughs> uh, they call her Wonder Woman. I see why. <laughs> Tammy Franklin on Anything is Possible. We'll see you next time.